Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to our second uh, Next Economy Movement Series event. Um, I'm Ryan Honeyman here with Nikish Guy Ingar, Kevin Bayuk, and Andrew Baskin from Lift Economy. And uh, just wanted to kick it over to Andrew for an intro. Yes, yes. So, welcome, everyone. Welcome back. Hashtag Next Economy Movement Series. And, um, you know, again, folks are going to be trickling in uh, as the conversation progresses. Um, but just so that we have the full hour to get to dedicate to this conversation, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so, um, Ryan just mentioned a few of the folks on the call. Um, yeah, I'm Andrew Baskin, partner at Let's Economy. And uh, in a little bit, we'll. Um, well, we have the pleasure of having an esteemed colleague, entrepreneur, investor, and friend, Nikishka Iyengar on the call. And Nikishka, we'll let you introduce yourself in a minute. Um, but first, actually, Ryan's going to briefly share just some housekeeping details real quick. So I'm gonna actually pass it back to you, Ryan. And real, real, real quick, actually, before I do, just, just so folks know so that we get it in, um, we're gonna be a little bit more brief on the uh, introduction to this series in this session. But um, if you go to the same link that you have here, um, Next Economy Movement, this one is slash two. The, the first session is under slash one. Um, so that at the beginning of that video gives uh, more in depth, um, just to give you context if you're needing that. So I'll pass it back to you, Ryan. Great, thanks, Andrew. Yeah, so just a few, few housekeeping logistics. Um, you know. So if you have used Crowdcast before, some of this will be redundant, but for folks who this is the first time, on the right side of the screen, you've got the chat box. So the chat we usually use for comments, you know, plus one, um, sharing resources. And the best place to ask questions is um, in the little bottom, there's an ask a question box. And if you submit your question there, it can be upvoted or downvoted. Um, and we're gonna try and answer all the questions. It also helps because it can it can start tracking for folks who watch the recording later. You can uh, you can track where we answered that question. It'll put like a timestamp on it on the time where that question was answered. So a handy little feature there. Um, and then after the session, uh, you know, this is going to be this is currently streaming on YouTube Live, uh, and it's going to be sent out. We'll send out a recording to you. Um, and we hope to, you know, engage with you in some Q&A. So uh, some of the broad strokes agenda, this, this, this session is framed around this idea of bridging conversations around an emergent shared vision for the next economy. And so, Andrew, do you want to take us into the introduction and overview and some of the expectation settings for today? Yes, yes. So just again to offer a little bit of framing um, as to how we're approaching this conversation, we're recognizing that we're not experts, that the expertise is in our collective brain trust here. Um, and our uh, intention is not to make this about us, but to make this about all of us. So we want to just be transparent and vulnerable that uh, we're all learning in this together. And also we might not get this right, right off the bat, but hopefully um, we can all be somewhat patient with the emergent process here and support carrying this conversation to a place that really serves um, the moment, serves the movement. Um, so again, um, just a brief introduction to this conversation series. It, th this is a, a, a series that is intended to um, sort of build on itself. We, we see ourselves as playing an organizing kind of convening role. And, uh, you know, we also really want to know, like, what are all of your thoughts? And we see ourselves as learning together with, um, you know, everyone in these conversations and trusting that the right people are showing up. So, you know, our question in general with the series is, is how can we grow and bring together a more powerful movement for the next economy? Um, and building off our last session, called Catalyzing the Conversation. It was a very rich conversation, uh, very engaged folks calling from all over. And um, the conversation really centered around, um, uh, sort of emergently centered around vision and bringing together multiple visions. There's so many different 
parts of the movement that are happening, multiple visions, and there's also a lot of overlap um, between those visions. So kind of uh, with the intention that this series is a series of conversations that builds on itself, the focus of our conversations today is bringing conversations together towards an emergent shared vision, um, knowing that there's many conversations that are happening. And so like, what does that look like to, to begin to link these spaces? So with that, to kick things off, I wanna um, bring in Nikishka to share um, sort of what comes up for you with this question around how do we effectively bridge these conversations and, and maybe begin to approach clarifying an emergent shared vision that we can all put our collective energy behind. But maybe first, um, just briefly, if you want to give a quick introduction of yourself and um, yeah, a bit about the incredible systems change work you're engaged in. Yeah, happy to. Can folks hear me okay? This is my first time doing Crowdcast, so cool. Okay. Um, hey, everyone. My name is Nikishka. I'm based in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I run a community wealth building organization called The Guild, and we're focused on um, closing the racial wealth gap through real estate and entrepreneurship programs. Um, I actually got introduced to everybody on this call and to Lived Economy um, almost, I guess, four years ago now when um, you guys launched the Force for Good Fund, and um, The Guild was an investee in the fund, but before that, I was we, uh, Ryan and I met at the B Corp conference and I was super interested in um, the fact that they were democratizing like the investment opportunity in the fund itself and were um, allowing for non-accredited investors to be part of it. And I think back then there weren't still, there weren't many funds that were doing that. And so this was like just fresh after the Jobs Act was passed, I think. Um, and so, it was super uh, compelling and I I made like a small investment then and then things came full circle um, a year and some later when they were looking for potential investees and I was like, well, how about my company? Because we're, look <laughs> we're looking to raise um, some capital on um, this real estate deal that we were doing. So on the real estate side, um, we are super focused on um, creating alternatives to the development models that exist today. So what can real estate development, um, not just in partnership with community look like, um, but also how can some, uh, how can more deals be owned by the community? So um, pretty much trying to create some sort of antidote to the, the system that um, just fuels gentrification and displacement. And if folks are familiar with Atlanta, like we're, we're known as the black Mecca, um, but thanks to gentrification, a lot of our black communities are getting um, pretty aggressively displaced. And so um, we're wanting to kind of tackle that problem. And of course, like, you know, real estate in this country is, is so mired in like all kinds of systemic problems. And so, um, recognizing that we have to take a whole systems approach to the problem and partner with um, community orgs and you know grassroots everyone from like housing justice organizers on one side to policymakers to to impact investors um, and everyone across that spectrum to be able to create um, some real systems change. So so that's kind of how um, I approach my work at the Guild. My background is um, I'd say like quote unquote in the social impact space for the last decade. I started. Um, my work in uh, microfinance in um, developing countries, specifically in India and Bangladesh, um, went from there to um, doing some climate action work with Fortune 500 companies through um, Deloitte Consulting, and then worked with a with a B Corp on the environmental side as well, and then um, yeah, launched the guild from there. So I'm happy to um, answer questions, dive into the question that you posed, Andrew. Um, yeah, whatever feels right. Oh, I'm already yeah. seeing questions. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, there's some really great questions coming up in the chat. And I know we're going to bring up uh, Isabel in just a minute. I wanted to, Kevin, I wanted to bring your voice into the mix real quick here um, before maybe passing it to someone else, just so folks can hear from you real quick. Um, yeah, well, I'm excited to hear from everybody else. Just uh, I'm uh, also, a work, as Ryan mentioned, I'm a worker owner at Lyft Economy and very excited to get and dive into these questions that are coming up. Awesome. Great. Well, what do you think should 
should we have uh, Nikishka take a first go at the question, or do you want to bring up folks, Andrew? What do you think? Hey, Maxine. <laughs> Hi, Maxine. Hey. Oh, right. uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, let's let's go ahead and I'm curious. Maybe let's start with Nikishka, and then <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want me to answer okay. answer the question that you posed, Andrew, or dive in? Uh, yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> let I think maybe just to kick off the conversation with the like with this sort of framing, how do we effectively bridge conversations and begin to clarify an emergent shared vision? And um, yeah, I know that sort of offline, we had talked about some of the different movements that are happening with the Zebras Unite and, um, you know, the B Corp space and all of that. So I just wanted to yeah. flesh that yeah, out. Yeah, I can, I can definitely start there. So one thing that I feel like is super exciting that's happening in this moment, and I think maybe folks on this call can identify with is things that I feel like we have been like screaming into the ether for <laughs> a decade is becoming like we were considered like the crazy like people on the fringe and um, are now becoming like mainstream conversations. Um, everything from like, you know, we have presidential candidates or had presidential candidates talk about reparations to um, almost every industry kind of um, grappling with the impacts of capitalism and, and, and like talking about it. I mean, I think I've seen like articles in the Wall Street Journal and Forbes all talking about what well, is capitalism over? Like what's after, you know? And so it's really, it's really interesting to see that um, come to come to fruition. I hate that it's taking something as crazy and overwhelming and um, as, as, yeah, it's like COVID-19. Um, but if this moment doesn't do it, then we're really screwed, right? So I feel like now is like that moment that we have, have unfortunately, um, it, yeah, unfortunately it's taken this, but it, it, we, we really need to um, capitalize on it and create sort of a new normal that we can um, return to. Um, and so with that, I feel like, at least in my experience, I've seen, um, like I said, like different industries um, grapple with this question. So one movement that I was sharing with Andrew is um, Zebras Unite. I don't know if folks on the on the call are familiar with it, but um, it, they emerged out of um, the the tech space. So like when you think about like the the VC and tech world, like uh, and their sort of pursuit of unicorns, right? Like the big one billion plus dollar valued companies and um, you know, so the traditional VC world seeks that and zebras is pretty much like the opposite of that. So the opposite of a unicorn um, in that they value sort of sustainable growth, um, revenue and, you know, healthy profits, not just um, growth for the sake of it and at the expense of like workers and really the whole economy, which we're seeing happen with um, lots of VC funded companies. And so um, this movement emerged, it's it's grown to, I think, um, I think it's like 5,000 founders um, across, I wanna say like five or six continents, um, 40 different countries. Um, I love that it's all women led. Um, so there's four, four or five women that have been um, sort of the champion of it, but it has spread um, beyond that now. And I say that, I'm, I, I mentioned that movement because it's coming out of a space that was so broken like tech, but they're now finding and in, in, in collaborating with um, quote unquote next economy practitioners. So one thing that's happened recently is um, Zebras Unite found sort of uh, like the, the, the next economy in um, folks like Common Future, um, people that are trying to push philanthropy to do better. And um, there's a new collaborative called the Inclusive um, capital collaborative that was founded with the idea of like we in order to make all of these systems and all of the industries whether it's tech whether it's real estate whether it's media well, like whatever it is um, the underpinnings of why things are so broken right now is our our financial system and how we fund these companies right across the board um, and so I, I think what's exciting for me right now is like these different these movements are finding each other and trying to rewrite the rules of finance um, to better serve um, the movements to better serve the companies and the founders and our communities um, at the end of the day. So, um, yeah, that's that's something that's been exciting for me lately. I see some folks um, 
know or familiar with Zebras Unite. Um, and yeah, just like that narrative shifting work, I think that's super important right now. Um, does that answer your question, Andrew? Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful, yeah, yeah. It's just a catalyst question, so yeah. There's no... <clears throat> yeah, that was just one. I mean, I feel like across the board, like um, there's a similar, like parallel movements. One of the um, original Zebras Unite founders, um, Vanessa Roanhoris, um, she's doing incredible work with, and she was at, on the Next Economy Now um, podcast too, but doing incredible work, um, sort of doing that same like finance narrative shifting work for native communities. And, um, you know, it, it, I'm working with Jessica Norwood on some other stuff. And I know she's been on the podcast as well and um, doing similar work with Runway Project and it for black founders and black communities. And so I feel like it's, yeah, like there's, there's uh, this exciting moment where like all the work that we've been doing, maybe in our own industries and sectors, we're now finding co-conspirators -conspir co and like trying to, um, yeah, like build movements together. So that's been really exciting for me. Awesome. Well, um, let me, I'm gonna go ahead and drop Kevin. Sorry, Kevin. Maximum of four up here. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm gonna push Kevin. Um, I see that Eric's question is the highest ranking, but I did promise Isabel to get her up. So, and I, Eric, I know you were up last time and we're gonna get you up. So um, let me get uh, Isabel up here. Uh, so I'll invite you to the screen, Isabel. And um, yeah, once you get up, just, uh, you know, you had two great questions. Um, and yeah, feel free to to ask away and we're, you know, we're happy to, to answer or let to get you involved. Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you. I don't know what's going on with the camera. I have it set up, but uh, I guess we'll just ignore it for now. Okay. Um, thanks so much for putting this together. This is super awesome. I'm super excited to, to talk with like-minded people. I'm fairly new to the movement, I guess, but this is something I found in the past few months I'm extremely passionate about and didn't know I had the vocabulary for and didn't know that there was a whole movement. Um, and so one of the things that I've I've been seeing in my fairly new path on this journey is that it feels to me like the movement is kind of spearheaded by people who have the economic means and the headspace to be thinking about these problems. And I'm also speaking from my personal experience of like a career led of just like every job I've had is like, we could be doing this better, but I'm not really sure how and which point. Um, and it wasn't until I kind of had some free time and I guess economic means to not worry about just having another job, which I feel like a lot of people are stuck in that loop. Um, and so, so getting involved in like, for example, um, Starting Good had their summit last week um, in Australia, but I feel like a lot of these conversations are, t are, get are tailored towards people who are of a similar background like me, um, economically and just professionally, I guess, reaching a point where you're kind of looking for something more and something better, and, um, but not really asking about how do we get the people who are maybe the blue collar workers on the front lines, how do we get their voices heard and involved? Um, because that, that's, that's a foundational tenet of, of the movement, right? It's every voice matters and how do we get their voices heard? And one of the concerns that I've had coming up is as I've, as I've talked about this, these ideas to people in my community, I'm pretty entrenched in the, in the startup community in San Diego. They've never heard of it, never heard of these words. Maybe some of them, you know, kind of are new to that. They, they've heard that concept of sustainability, not just being environmental. Um, but a lot of them are like, oh, that's a great idea. I, you're the first person who's ever told me. Um, and they've run their own companies and they've been pretty involved for a long time in the startup world. So it's just, it's really surprising to me that just in the first place, people don't know about it. Um, but I guess my, my question now is like, especially with COVID, a lot of people are just worrying about survival. Um, and my, my concern is as this movement is moving forward, how do we make sure we don't leave people behind? There's a lot of people in our country who still don't have access to computers and internet, or if they do, they don't have the time to sit down and, and read about all this and join you know, these conversations. So just kind of curious to hear your thoughts on that. 
Yeah. Do y'all, I, I can go first if, if y'all want. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. And that's something we, in our, like, in the Next Economy Movement talk about all the time. And I'll, I'll just speak from, from my perspective and, and the way I think about it. But, um, like, so my background has, I guess I, my background has started um, in organizing spaces. So, like, I started out as a student organizer, have, um, have been pretty much a lifelong um, community organizer. But um, I, I think one one way to address what and and um, sorry, is that background noise? I can't tell if it's from my computer or not. But um, can y'all hear me? Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, what one way like that I like to think about it is um, taking that same organizing approach to the work that we're doing, whether it's building our companies or building um, this movement. Um, so, like right down to how I think about my split with time and energy that I put in. Um, so in this moment of COVID, there was a whole lot to do on the side of our company. Um, but I've, I've, I've at least tried to carve out um, like 20% of my time and energy to go into um, doing some rapid response, community organizing, mutual aid work, for example, just, just to get us through this like social distancing phase of COVID. Um, and I've tried to do that across and I feel like maybe that's like one answer. I'm sure folks on the call might have other answers, but I think um, having our ear, heart, soul to the ground um, in deeply rooted in relationships and in communities that we're trying to serve, um, like always take that approach first is how I look at it. Um, and so the work that the Gila does on the, on the real estate side, like, yeah, we're trying to do these like big lofty, we have big lofty ambitions in terms of like rewriting the rules of real estate finance and, you know, redoing capital stacks to allow for community owned development. But none of that matters if the community doesn't even understand what we're doing and if, or if the words and um, concepts and everything we're using seems foreign or seems like jargon. And so um, always working in close partnership and relationship with um, grassroots organizers that are living and breathing these challenges um, and that are bearing the brunt of our various systems of oppression. Um, yeah, like just being in a deep relationship and in deep listening with them is a is a good place to start, I think. Um, and 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 not end there, but I mean, obviously, like bring them into the movement through these models and through these conversations. But um, I think I don't know if it was you or somebody else. Like somebody brought up the the like the digital divide, right? Like we're seeing that with COVID is that, yeah, we're doing, we're all in these Zoom calls and doing a bunch of um, like webinars and all of that. And there still very much is the digital divide. And it's been really refreshing to see like how, um, like a lot of folks that weren't online as much are now starting to like, um, to shift that. So I'm seeing that through like, for example, in Atlanta, um, a lot of, like old black churches are now doing all their services online. So you have like 80 plus year old black women on prayer lines and on Zoom calls. And it's like, that's a great, like start with some of those like legacy institutions or anchor institutions that um, have those relationships and connections um, with um, the folks that we're trying to kind of bring along in the movement. And, um, you know, I think, I, but I say all that and I, I also recognize that, that the digital divide is real. and. Yeah, I'm curious to see if anyone else on the call has um, thoughts on that. Yeah, and maybe um, <clears throat> one thing I could ask is, maybe I'll pull up Eric too, because um, Eric's question around, um, do we have metrics or sensors to know how the next economy movement is holding up during the COVID crisis? I see that sort of like dovetailing with this piece. So um, let me just, uh, See if Eric is available here. Do we and, lose um, him? What's that? No. Oh, no, Eric, Eric's ready. Yeah. Cool. Let me unfocus there. Andrew, did you have any thoughts? Um, yeah. Well, yeah. So, I mean, I really appreciating uh, your question, Isabel, and also, yeah, I and and love Eric's comment of you know, like Eric's. Um, self-described as like newish to this space as well. And we'll hear from, hear from Eric in a second. 
Um, but yeah, really appreciating the fresh perspective and the values that I'm hearing through what you're saying of not not leaving folks behind. Um, there's also, you know, yeah, the challenge that Kevin spoke to in the chat that you spoke to, um, which is the sort of cultural invisibility of the next economy movement, which um, for me brought up um, just this larger sort of, um, I think part of the intention, um, like with this conversation of, of the question around how do we bridge all of these different movement areas um, that are happening simultaneously, which maybe some of us, like we might be aware of some parts of the movement and there's other parts of the movement happening in other areas. I know that there are a lot of um, working class or organizer groups that self advocate and then also, um, you know, like um, Nikishka mentioned like Jessica Norwood earlier in the conversation um, or Common Future and, and folks that are really looking out for, um, you know, equity and, 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 and inclusiveness in the, in the work and in the movement across, you know, culture, socioeconomic classes, et cetera. Um, so, but it, a lot of them are, some, some of them are, 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 are in conversation and some of them are not in conversation. So kind of what's really interesting to me and in, in growing out of this place of like collective vision and, and, and energy is like, how do we bridge these spaces? Because we simultaneously still, part of the cultural invisibility of the next economy movement is we still have the churning replication of the business as usual paradigm in higher education. Um, while there's a simultaneous lack of a robust educational ecosystem um, through formal channels that 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 teaches about the multitude of uh, aspects of you know what we refer to as the next economy from uh, it, it is an inclusive whole from impact investing to you know social entrepreneurship and and uh, you know maybe differentiating that from like a systems change entrepreneur, which I would say that maybe Nikishka is of like working towards systems change. And there's so many different pieces, um, but there's there's not really formal channels for that. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's still un unsurprising to know that there's folks that have never heard of these things because they're culturally invisible. So yeah, I don't know if that's adding too much to what was shared, but that's what came up for me. But I'd love to maybe pass it over to Eric and hear what's coming up for you. Yeah, I think, um... You guys can hear me? Okay. Um, addressing what Isabel said, I think there is one thing I had to recognize was like, this is a new developing space. Like this existed for a while, but it's like really hard to find. Uh, but when you do find like the value is so high. Um, and then on the cultural side, I think there's like for sure recognition that like cooperative movements were very uh, popular in Europe, uh, popular uh, in more liberal, progressive places, which do lead to be more white. And to like, be honest, in this journey, it's like, besides Andrew and Maxine, who I connected with, like the only three black guys that I've actually been able to interact with on this topic. All that to say is like, when I talk to it about people in my community, they're open to it. And there's like, but I had to recognize that I have to pioneer in this space, not necessarily expect there to be a lot of people already to kind of collaborate with. But when you do find it, it's, it's one of the few communities and spaces that kind of aligned to something that I felt in my intuition for a long time where, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the Next Economy talked about like an anti-whiteness workshop or something like that, uh, that happens in California, which is just like to hear white people talk about anti-whiteness, as long as we're talking about economic development, it's just a different thing in this space. And I don't want to say everyone's perfect, like there's still growth in that area, um, but I don't know, that encouraged me, Isabel. Um, and that's for my question, um, Next economy is very theoretical for me. I know that there's a lot of things happening in other places. Uh, it's exciting things to see the things like the guild and stuff like that. Uh, but I think our big hypothesis is like, these economies are more resilient to COVID crises or kind of any crisis. Um, and like to theory that it makes sense to me how it would play out. But I'm just curious of like, is that living out in reality? <laughs> is that living out in practice? Um, or is this like revealed some other issues in there? So, I also, um, Eric, I put a, a little book recommendation if you're curious um, in the in the chat. Um, 
collective courage. It's, um, it, it details like the, the co-op movement um, in African American communities. And I, uh, yeah, it's just a, it's a great, it's a great resource. Um, and to add to like, and I guess to weave into what you and Isabel are, are talking about, I think there's two things that are simultaneously true. Um, there is this, you know, there's, there's truth around like folks that are dealing with the most severe impacts of all of our systems, like don't necessarily have the luxury and the privilege to like um, dream up all the stuff that we're talking about. But at the same time, there's also so much wisdom there because of the fact that they're struggling with the these systems, right? So there's like the solutions and, and a lot of other frameworks actually do exist there. I think sometimes um, like this next economy movement, the the way it looks in the mainstream, it still feels pretty white sometimes. And um, part of like the culture of whiteness is to um, to feel like they're like reinventing or, or not reinventing, inventing something new. Um, when actually a lot of this has existed in our communities, we might have different language for it. Um, this is becoming more like prevalent for me or uh, relevant for me right now as we're doing this mutual aid work where we're um, working with a lot of immigrant communities and we're trying to do some like language justice work around translating our applications and the process and all of that. And we're like, actually mutual, like mutual aid, the word in English sure might be foreign, but like every community has their term for it. Um, and, and, and that's, that's existed. And so I think it's, it's, it's more like, it's as much a process of unlearning as it is learning and kind of looking to some of these other communities that are impacted by all of these systems and like cultivating the leadership there because it exists. And that's kind of why I mentioned the organizing approach is like when you're a community organizer, like you, you, you don't approach like with a solution, you, you start by trying to build consensus and build like to learn as much as possible from um, the folks that you're building community with to see like, what are their pain points? What are they going through? What's their day been like? And you know, what's coming up for them in this. And so I, in that process, like the process of, I guess, practicing community organizing in this movement work, it, 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 you realize that actually a lot of what we do, we don't have to invent something new because it, it's, it's existed. It's just about um, resourcing the, the people that are, are being impacted, but have the solutions for it. So, um, so that's just something I wanted to bring up because that really like um, bothers me sometimes when folks are like, Oh, the new economy. And it's like, and and then the movement looks very white, um, but it's actually no. It's like native folks, black folks, immigrants. Like we've we've been doing this work, and we we have a lot of the answers. And so um, so yeah. Anyway, I just wanted to. I think both of those things are true at the same time. So just wanted to share that. Thank you. And your work is inspiration too, by the way, for the guild and stuff like that. So it gives me a lot of hope in that space. So thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Well, I was hoping to maybe bring up Maxime. Um, so let's see if I uh, can invite Maxime on. A lot of this dovetails together. Um, so while he's joining here. Oh, uh, there he is. <laughs> hey, Maxime. Yeah, I would love to get your, um, you know, thoughts and comments on what, what's been said, but also, you know, your question, how do we ensure this work is serving the needs of the most vulnerable slash uh, marginalized while also building radical new systems? Yeah. Love to get your thoughts on that. So and, just for a little bit more context, I'm, I'm only on this journey like a year or two in, you know. Um, I've been feeling this, like you, Eric, like I've been feeling this on the inside. Like, I think ancestrally, we know this, like it's in our body, but then every day we're like, we're just trying to operate and survive. Um, and I'm trying, like, I know there's like everyday needs that we need to be like serve as like marginalized people or vulnerable people, um, or just as people, cause there's a current system we're under, but then how do we build a future so we don't have to deal with this again? Because, I think um, on, on Ruthie Roy, she wrote something about like this being a portal. Like, and like, 
Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like this is the port we're seeing, like we're seeing a possible avenue to the future right now during this pandemic. And are we gonna like, and I think the world right now is like trying to clamp back down to what it's been doing forever. How do we make sure that we serve everybody's needs because this is a trying depression time for everybody, for most people, but we also build something that's different. I think that's one thing I'm trying to, I'm, I've been wrestling with trying to figure out like, because yeah, the, yeah, we have to get everybody to learn. I think one thing is like getting everybody to learn and understand this, but then we start growing more. Oh, thanks. Yeah, you put that in there. Um, but yeah, that's what I'm just trying to figure out dancing between like the short term and the long term. I've talked a lot, so I'm going to let one of y'all go. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's why we invited you, though, Nikiska. We want your fight. <laughs> but yeah, Andrew or Nikiska, either you want to. Do you want to go, Andrew? No. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I, Kevin put some stuff in the uh, in the chat as well. Um, I think a lot of this. So you asked him, you know, short term and long term, and. Like, let me also just say, like, I'm also just learning. Like, I might have been in this space for a, like a few more years, but like, it's so much is emergent and evolving all the time mm -hmm. that like I don't necessarily have all the answers. I just, um, you know, when we when we know better, we try to do better, and that's pretty much the most we can do. But, um, but yeah, some of that is uh, he shared about like kind of practicing and embodying a lot of what we want to see with the next economy in just like our daily acts so like where we get our food from and where we um get anything and i'll say like i'll be the first one to say i still order a lot of shit online on amazon <laughs> like i am trying so hard to divest and this pandemic threw a wrench and all of that like it you know and so so it's hard it's hard it's hard to embody a lot of this but it, but it's it's important work that needs to be done and um yeah, one thing that I'm trying to do, I, I've been seeing a lot of articles about um, like after the depression, how like the New Deal um, cemented a lot of like stuff that was to come, policies, programs, um, business, like post-depression era um, and like what that should look like. And I know we've got like versions of it with like the Green New Deal and you know, those conversations happening. Um, but I'm I'm trying to think of like strategy for like our overall movement and like looking to some things in history that might not like from a strategy standpoint that might have they might have been really great, but from a an outcomes like they didn't necessarily serve us, like mm -hmm. people that look like us, but they were smart like tactically and strategically. And so um kind of borrowing stuff from there um to the extent that um is possible for like the whole movement but but yeah it's really hard like just so we mentioned jessica norwood like we just had a conversation this morning about like what does it mean to embody a lot of the stuff that we're talking about when it comes to running of our businesses right like we talk a lot of stuff we talk about like systems and in a lot of these concepts and like capitalism but like you said like you've been feeling it in your body for a while and you like you might not have had the words for it but we've all felt it um, and so what is it, what does it mean to move differently? Um, so that we can like truly divest from capitalism from our bodies. And like, you know, for me, like that means setting boundaries ar around how much I'm, I'm working. I tend to tend to work and have this like thing to like produce and produce and think about my productivity. And it's like, I I've had to really like check myself on that and divest from that because, um, yeah, like that's that's also a tool of, of, of capitalism and white supremacy. And so like um, using this pandemic as a moment to like, uh, yeah, like practice what I'm what I'm talking about conceptually in like my daily like my daily life and my practice and uh, and how I run our business. Like so I, like I'm probably rambling, but some of these I don't have answers. I just it's it's how are we? I But I do think um, to Kevin's point, it is about um yeah like embodying all of that in like a lot of times you see um we talk about this in movement spaces where like the most like left 
like woke, like you know, progressive organizers sometimes are the most toxic to work with and organize with, right? Like because yeah. they've internalized all of the systems and and add, so so a lot of that work has to start from like unlearning and and divesting from the systems truly at like a cellular level for ourselves, or we're just going to replicate. Um, a lot of the issues, um, because it's people that carry systems. Like, yeah, these problems are systemic, but it's the people that are upholding these these systems. And so, so yeah, I think that's and, and that's honestly the hardest the hardest part. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you. And you know, one thing that that came up for me. Have, have any of you um, read Ian Haney Lopez's book uh, Merge Left? So no, I just interviewed him for the podcast, and so coming soon on our podcast feed, but a little teaser, he, um, he has some really good insight into like cross, um, cross racial solidarity work and like the narrative that like works. Um, so in the left, we have like these two wings of the left. One's like the economic populism, which is like, um, you know, we have to think, focus on things like healthcare and education, blah, 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 but we can't talk about race because if we talk about race, like the white working class, like the middle of the country will abandon us. So that's like this sort of more like Bill Clinton, older school approach, um, but still maybe adopted by current presidential candidates uh, in the Democratic Party. And then we have the racial justice wing of the party, which is like, we've been silent too long. We need to dismantle white supremacy. We can't wait for, we can't wait for white folks to be comfortable. Like this has to happen now. And so the, Obviously, like the challenge that Ian Haney Lopez talks about is, is basically have like 10% of white folks will be like, hell yes, the racial justice, like we need to do this. Like, I agree with this. This is like, I'm doing it because I believe that this is the right thing or like, you know, I'm like down for it. But it's not like enough to really like shift the whole country. And then if you have, if you go economic populism, then people of color, like you're leaving us out again. Like, like what the hell, like F you, you know, we're not going to vote. So what they did is they looked at um, across the country, they started talking about like, you know, who's benefiting from racism. And if you really look at it, it's, it's, not, um, it's not that there's like a bunch of people benefiting from racism, because if you have like white union leaders who are saying like, I wanna elect Trump, like Trump and Re Republicans are actually like destroying unions. And so, the people who are benefiting from racism are a lot of a few wealthy elite people like the Koch brothers, the Mercers, like Frank Luntz, like Republican strategists. And so the Republicans for many years have known that if you talk about racism and talk about the border and talk about safety and terrorism, you can divide black and brown and white folks, but you can um, still win elections. And so what Ian Haney Lopez did is he went out to like Ohio and like other places where he talked to white working class people who are like in the middle. And he said like, what if, would this message sway you? Is um, we're all working hard together, black, brown and white, but there are certain people, certain greedy elites who are actually using race to divide us in order to profit from racism and to, 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 to break down solidarity. Um, and so we need to come together around like shared, you know, shared ideas, shared vision. And it's the most powerful, like if you basically talk about race, but connect race, like who is actually benefiting from racism to specific elites, for some reason, like it's, it's both true, but also it, um, it helps uh, white white sort of more conservative people actually be like, yeah, like that is happening. Like, of course, wealthy people are actually like in like Fox News is like sort of like blasting out racist ideas all the time. And it's actually benefiting the one percent. And so he was Ian Haney Lopez had a great talk with Alicia Garza from the common at the Commonwealth Club about like how to reframe our movement around like we need to talk about cross racial solidarity by pointing to who is benefiting so that even white people who are maybe like, I don't, I like who say I'm not racist, but don't do anything, actually realize that building cro <laughs> cross, cross racial solidarity is actually a way to benefit them. Like, it's not just like, like, like electing corporate Republicans is actually like 
hurting like white working class people too. And so it's like, it, it removes that like, well, I'm, I don't, I don't see the connection to like, oh, wow, like my own family depends on cross-racial solidarity to defeat elite interests. And, and then it also meets the needs of racial justice because like, yeah, we need to build cross-racial solidarity and defeat racism. So it's like, for me, it's been, I've been sort of tripping off that idea because I was like, wow, like this is a really cool message that's both like, it, it seems true to me, but also can get like that movement that we keep talking about in pieces uh, more together. So anyways, I just went on a little bit of a, a ramble, but that's been coming up. Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> can I share something that Eric put in the comments, which I thought was so yeah. on point um, about the, the new economy will be built with great mental health practices, maternity time and laughter aka energizing work. I love that. And something that's come up for me during this pandemic is like, um, you know, I, this pandemic is like a moment for like us to have all I collectively realized like how much um, women and women of color like hold, uh, like how much of the labor in the economy that we hold, like just doing like domestic work or the work of care, right? Like whether it's it's child like child care or um, caring like hospice workers or um, just health care workers in general um, and how there's so much of that that's put um, that ends up being like the woman's job um, but I feel like th that's bringing up another point for me like that the next economy to Eric's point um, will value those it will be a fundamentally like just what we value is going to look very different. We're going to value mental health. We're going to value things like laughter and, and, you know, maternity time and um, it, like center, like the care economy. We're going to, we're, we're going to value caring for other people, whether it's children or elders or whatever. Um, whereas that labor right now, it's like invisibilized. It's undervalued. It's definitely not paid. There's no way to like, like quantify it and value it. And so, um, I think, yeah, in the next economy, that, that that's something that has to come um, and be kind of at the center. Um, Ai-jin Poo does a lot of work um, and talks a lot about um, this with like the perspective of um, domestic workers. Um, she leads the National Domestic Workers Alliance and um, yeah, like it's just a brilliant mind when it comes to, to thinking about um, cross class like solidarity too, so. I, I think one thing that you know, aligns with that cross-class solidarity is I um, I read a book, I also listened to it, uh, by Kenyatta uh, Kiyanga Yamada Taylor on the, how do how we get free about the, the Kambihi Collective. Um, and they had a message, like the way they worked together and created a unifying message of like what their vision of transformation was, um, that's the thing that like really kind of solidified it and that and it was across race across class across like sexuality like everything like they looked at all of it you know and it took time to really analyze and and bounce back and forth to really craft a message and a and a vision for the future and i think that would create you know kind of something shared as we work together and like bounties off each other and kind of an analysis like critique refine and then like all right we're crafting this together so it's like a shared crafting so. awesome. uh, can i go now thanks maxine <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'm gonna bring up uh isabel <laughs> thank you for joining up here i'll light isabel up here's that andrew's reconnecting hi Hey, Isabel. I'm so glad there was yeah, another That's so rare. Yeah. Yeah, feel free to, to ask your question or, yeah, give us any context. Yeah, so one thing that I think is interesting and I've been noticing, like, amongst friends of mine and on Twitter is you have a lot of people that are, like, anti-capitalism. So, you know, we hate capitalism. Let's get rid of it. And there's this very strong sentiment that they know what the problem is. And I think uh, one of the challenges of this movement is to give people like, yes, we know that capitalism is wrong and what's the vision of where we're trying to go and what's the vocabulary? How do we articulate where we're trying to go? How do we give people words so that it's not just 
negative, we hate capitalism, but yes, we hate capitalism. And now we have this new economy that we're all co-creating. And, you know, these are the various things that are involved in that co-creation um, or how you can help or take steps to help build. Um, I think there's a big gap there and that's narrative. Um, but curious if you have any thoughts on how to develop that narrative or how you've seen that narrative be developed in communities that you've worked in or in businesses that you've worked with. Um, yeah, or just any observations around that. Can you just clarify the question one more time real quick, Isabel? Yeah, sorry. Um, okay. So I was saying that um, you see a lot of like anti-capitalism content of people like knowing what the problem is, very able to articulate what they don't like, but not necessarily seeing where they wanna go or what the vision is, or like knowing even that there is an alternative or being able to like think outside the box um, and instead of just taking it like, oh, this is just how the world works and you know, bummer that it's not gonna work for you or either your next generation instead of like, how do you inspire minds and give them the vocabulary and awareness that there is a whole uh, new movement out there that's being created. And I think that's the biggest gap that is currently in, in the conversation, I think in a new economy is, yes, we know what the problem is, but, but how do we help take people on a journey to talk about and actualize a solution? Yeah. Um. Andrew, did you, were you going to say something? Uh, you go ahead first. Okay. Um, I was just going to say, yeah, there's examples of um, other organizations that I've seen that, that, have, that do it well. And I can just share an example from my own, but um, like, I know Boston Ujima project, um, they might've come up in uh, on Lyft's podcast or something, but um, they do a good job of like catalyzing and like putting up this like shared vision that people can feel excited about. So you're not just feeling like you're fighting against something, but you're fighting for something. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's super, like there's all these like, yeah, like studies out there to show like psychologically, like we, we want to feel like we can be part of something positive, not just constantly having to resist and resist and resist. And so I think that, I think that's super valid what you're asking. Um, one thing that I, we've been doing with our work at the Guild is, so like we, I mentioned this earlier, but we were trying to create like an alternative development, um, real estate development model. And so we know like the, uh, the all of the, what we stand against is like gentrification and big development and blah, blah, blah. Like, but when we talk to communities, um, obviously they already know all this because they're feeling the effects of it. But what we try to like share things like, like, wouldn't it be cool if you if you could not only decide what came into your neighborhood? So if you want a grocery store or if you want a daycare or whatever you want, like it, having so what we taking concepts like democratizing governance to this means like you get to decide what what comes into your neighborhood. And, you know, so things like that or like democratizing ownership, we say, well, Imagine now, now when property values go up because there's like a, you know, the city is pouring, I don't know, dollars to revitalize your neighborhood instead of like being worried about the increase in like property taxes, you're getting to benefit from it because you own a part of this, this, this building and actually your value and the share, the value of your shares is going up. And that means you get to take home some of this money. So you get that shared prosperity language, um, showing that to them in, in like real life projects and examples, I think it helps kind of, and like personalizing the example a bit um, versus just talking about it in concepts and systems. Um, yeah, that's, that's and I, I use Boston Ajima because I feel like from some of their work that I've seen, like they do a, a really good job of like, yeah, personalizing a lot of those things. Yeah, what came up for me um, is is well, first of all, I want to really appreciate and acknowledge the question that you're asking, um, and and also I, I saw uh, uh, um, some other questions in the chat, kind of around how um, there's different parts of your question, but one part is like how can folks at whatever place they are in the spectrum of I just learned about the next economy to I've been deep in this work for decades, um, you know, how can folks meaningfully plug in, engage, stay aware of what's happening? One framework that um, lift the economy team references a lot is the the two loops model from the Burkana Institute that kind of like 
the business as usual economy is is on the is on the decline while the you know next economy movement is is up and there's a bunch of kind of like pioneers that are bridging that gap and then there's this role of illuminators um, within that space who who lift up those leaders models and stories so that you know we can learn those things and uh, we mentioned the next economy now podcast other resources um, the new economy coalition newsletter is like rich information um, there's so many um, and uh, I, I also wanted to shout out uh, movement generation they just recently last week um, held and if this is ongoing I highly encourage people to sign up for it they have something going on called um, course correction. And there's a whole small group discussion guide that goes along with that. It's multilingual in Spanish, um, uh, sign language and visual graphics. It's incredibly impressive. And um, and that's gonna be ongoing um, for the next several weeks. And I will, I'll share a link in the chat to, um, to more information about that. But just wanted to uh, shout that out really quick. Um, oh, there we go. Thanks, Ryan. Um, but yeah, so yeah, maybe I'll, I'll step back. That's kind of what's coming up for me. Yeah, um, I'm glad that you, I like, I wrote down your term illuminators, I think. Um, yeah, Iris just asked a question, can you define illuminator? And I'm gonna interpret that question uh, as like an amplification, like you're taking what's already out there and you're giving it, um, you're making noise about it and trying to give it a little bit more of the spotlight um, than it would normally get. So um, I know that um, New Economy Coalition, they have these like incredible newsletters where they're highlighting all of the articles, all of the organizations, all of the job openings, all of the, like all the work that they're doing. Um, and so they're, they're cross um, pollinating for lack of a better term, uh, each other's work. And I think for anyone that's in this um, movement, it's so important that that we each take that illuminator role um, because it 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 is the only way that we're going to be able to I don't know lift each each other up uh, and I think a part of this new economy next economy is collaboration um, so that we are yeah supporting each other in every way that we can just as um, Nick Nikisha you had invested right in the fund and then they invest in you like that's a beautiful that is a beautiful example of i think the economy that um everyone's trying to work on so thank you oh i think you're muted andrew you're on mute thanks i'm um, sorry about that but yeah building building off of that and then i see we only have a couple minutes left here but i just want to maybe uh draw some threads through this and you hit the nail right on the head illuminators yeah so there's like culturally invisible to much of us uh is the next economy and shining a light into those dark spaces by uplifting, sharing out these models. And this is part of, you know, Eric mentioned um, uh, in the chat is uh, like, just not have the a huge part of, of what we're wanting this series to be is to transform the relationship of just receiving and, 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 and downloading information and to create opportunities for us to engage in this conversation and participate meaningfully, you know, and that could look like inviting people more to this conversation or to movement generations, you know, ongoing series or what have you, or, or, you know, how can, how can we share with each other ways to participate and invite people in. And so that is a, a very um, intentional part, uh, a part of the intention that we're holding for this series. And so um, I just wanna, if, if, if those opportunities to participate or share other you know, sources of illuminators, Laura Flanders is another one that comes to mind. Um, <clears throat> there's so many. Uh, and and also through through the myriad of books you know that that um, people are continuously publishing. So um, hopefully that that helps to clarify that that term and some of the intention that we're having with this is to actually illuminate all of us you know, like in this in this broader network. This is the we. Um, so I was a little bit ranty, but I'll I'll hand it over back to you, Ryan, to to close us out and maybe Nikish cool. get any closing thoughts. Yeah, Nikishki, you want any closing thoughts for we? Yeah, um, just real quick, like, and 
I don't, I, I'm trying to find my words with this because I don't want to end on like, like sounding like a bummer, but um, on the point of um, being an illuminator, I think it's also very important as we, we create this next economy to be mindful of like, I like the term Eric um, used too, which is signal boosting, um, where we, we be mindful of like, where we hear things and solutions that we like, like truly, especially if it's coming from folks that are from a marginalized background, that we are truly like signal boosting what they're doing versus um, sometimes I think we unintentionally co-opt without me like without meaning to, but um, sometimes I see things in the next economy space that I'm like, I could have sworn it wasn't a white person that was talking about this like uh, several years ago, right? And so just to be mindful of that, um, I don't think we do it with intent uh, to be intentionally like that, but um, yeah, like how are we uh, building power with um, and for folks that are marginalized across the board? That's a really, really great point. Cool. Well, my three-year-old and five-year-old are banging on the door. <laughs> I don't even know what, one of them's crying. Um, but I'm just super excited that we're having this conversation. Um, thank you to Nikishka for joining, um, to Eric, Maxime, Isabel, um, both Isabels. Um, you know, anyone else I forget? I don't think so, but if I did forget you, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> thanks for joining. Um, Andrew, anything you want to say about like, how do we continue the conversation? Like, I think the chat stays here, right? So like anyone can access yeah. the chat. We'll try to send out a recording to everyone who signed up. But yeah, any any thoughts about like continuing the conversation, Andrew? You want to say? Yeah. So so as as uh, Ryan mentioned, this chat is live in in this session. So the you, I mean, actually in each session. So if you go to there, like at the top of the bar in Crowdcast, it says schedule, and if you click on that, you know, you can see session one and session two, and then you know the future sessions because we're taking an immersion approach are um, TBD right now. Um, and but if you go back to session one, you could still engage with the conversation in that chat, watch that video, um, and you can engage with the chat here. It's really great too if you continue to add questions into the add question box so that people can upvote and downvote them. So like so that we can engage through that way. And then um, we'll be sending an email out as soon as we have things dialed in for the next session, which is going to be in a few weeks, June sixteenth. Um, but yeah, please continue to in the chat ask questions, or excuse me, in the ask ask question box ask questions, and in the chat um, continue to engage and also share resources, opportunities for folks to participate, um, etc. So I, I trust that you know I might not be covering all of the bases, but I trust the collective brain trust that exists in this space here to bring forward what feels um, valuable. So thank you, again. thank you so much, everyone. Again, as as Kevin said, this is super affirming and I'm um, really excited to engage with all of you. Go ahead, thank you. No, I was just asking, is there a way for folks to continue the conversation like between now and June 16th? Like, is there, uh, is it on Facebook or something like that where folks can still like, yeah. Feed yeah, so, so right now, um, I, so right now we're just having the conversation live in this space on Crowdcast and it could be in this, in this session or um, you know, as soon as we get things dialed up for the next session, feel free to start you know engaging with that. Um, and of course, you know, we Lyft has our you know uh, Facebook page. But as as far as this conversation right now, I think this is a good kind of collective space. So, yeah, I want to be respectful of folks' cool. time though. So you wanna close this out? All right, everyone. Thank you so much. Much love. Thanks, y'all. Thank you so much.